So I begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me and for organizing this colloque. You realize I have also to apologize that I have a title in French, but I will be speaking English. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I also have to apologize for the technology. Uh, it appears that my presentation did not wish to come to France. So I have brought it on this machine, which is not exactly compatible with the machine. Here you will see immediately why we have this delay. Oh. <laughs> and also un peu grossier, no? Uh, so the story begins with Gauss, who will do two things. He will unite the theory of this differential equation, the hypergeometric equation, with the power series you see below, which is the hypergeometric series, and he will show that the series is one of the solutions of the equation. Uh, to do this, he plays games. He changes the function in this fashion. He increases or decreases one of the parameters by one. In this way, he gets several different functions. Any three are related essentially by the hypergeometric equation. But what he published is only the study of the series and the functions it represents. Unpublished and in the same sequence of numbered paragraphs is the study of the differential equation itself. And here he finds an independent solution from the one before. He has a basis of solutions. He transforms the variable in certain ways, five of the elements of a particular group of transformations. Um, he uh, experiments with changing the uh, solution and the equation that we're looking for to simplify things. And he finds that by formal manipulation, you reach an equation which is quite certainly false. Okay, this intrigues him. And he explains how this could be. There is a clash between the solution function and the series that represents it in a certain domain. The many-valued function is defined everywhere except at 0, 1, and infinity. The infinite series only on a certain circular domain is variable, is complex. And he explains that this impossible equation from before is akin to this mistake. You have many-valued functions, and you would not infer from the behavior of the arcsine function that 30 degrees was equal to 150 degrees. So he is studying analytic continuation of complex valued functions of a complex variable defined on a certain domain. And he compares this with the representation you get by means of power series. The analytical continuation of a complex function outside of its domain of convergence will lead us to I'll read Gauss and us to monodromy. That's why the story starts really here. And it does not start with Kummer. Kummer's study, which later mathematicians use, is almost entirely about a real variable, not a complex variable. And monodromy is a complex variable phenomenon in this period. So I'm sorry, again, Monsieur Riemann has had rather more good dinners than he should. Um, we move immediately to Riemann and his dissertation of this year, 1851, in which he defines, it's still our definition, what it is for a function to be a holomorphic function. It's to be complex differentiable. He explains that this function, these functions are conformal, except where their derivative vanishes and it has a branch point. These ideas he would have taken from Gauss. Gauss had made a study of conformal mappings in 1822 in which these ideas, without being so tightly connected to complex function theory, are there. And Riemann, of course, adds that the real and imaginary parts of a complex function are separately harmonic functions. But he makes a great innovation, 
that's an astonishing innovation for its time, and we take it completely for granted now, that the domain of the complex function should be really something you get with only this property, that at each point you can move in two directions, and you can then have the Angiume Cauchy Riemann equations. Such a domain need not be part of the plane. It certainly need not be all of the plane. It need not be topologically equivalent to the plane. This is a complete new departure for function theory. And he gives, in 1851, these examples. The third one is not a planar domain. It's a domain here with arms that come out and connect in this fashion. Okay? So you're looking at something which is not even a planar domain. And a few years later, he turns to the hypergeometric equation. And he remarks that the unpublished study of this series uh, is in Gauss's Nachlass. And amongst other people who've worked on this problem since Gauss, uh, there is, of course, Kummer. And he actually has a very big general setting for this uh, topic, which is uh, linear differential equations with algebraic coefficients, but I shan't take us in that direction at all. Um, it's because Riemann has read the Gauss Nachlass that he discusses functions which he called P functions. And the notation P, the letter P, is taken from Gauss. So this is how he defines them. He says uh, they have three branch points. Uh, there's a linear relation between uh, the uh, branches. Only three branches satisfy a linear relation with constant coefficients. And the function can be written in terms of what you see locally in the fashion indicated here. Uh, so they look very like the solutions of the hypergeometric equation. That's, uh, that's really where he's coming from. He has formalized the if you like, geometric behavior of the solution of the uh, hypergeometric equation, and he's starting from this more abstract point of view. He makes certain preliminary uh, assumptions to avoid troubling cases. The exponent differences are integers, and their sum is 1. The exponents are coming from the branch points. The exponents are what uh, will give you the uh, particular solutions of this equation, the exponent differences will control the quotient of the solutions. Okay? So we'll need them, Riemann will need them later on. Um, his p functions can be continued analytically in a loop around a branch point, and he explains that in this way you get a matrix of constants which are determined by taking a particular branch of the p-function around, in this case, he's going to say the branch point at z equals a. You have another one for b and another one for c. If you think of those three points on the sphere, going around two of them is like going around the other one, but in the opposite direction. So, if you go around all three of them in this order, you have essentially performed the identity transformation. So the matrices, the monodromy matrices that he has, satisfy this identity. And he claims that the coefficients of these matrices completely determine the uh, geometrical behavior of the p-function. So before we proceed, a little digression on the words. The word Monodromic is due to Cauchy in, in these years, 1851-52, when he's engaged in a race to write up his ideas of complex function theory for the audience they never got 20 or 30 years before. And this is what he means by monodromic. It's continuous. It's single-valued as a function. Um, Hermit, 1851, introduced the idea of using matrices to describe how algebraic functions are branched. Historians hate first, the first occurrence of. We had a very nice joke from Colin earlier on. Um, I don't suppose I, anyone else wants them to be a last use of the idea of monodromy. <laughs> but uh, it may be that Riemann is the first to consider products of monodromy matrices. The term is used extensively by Camille Jordan in the Traité that. Um, 
Caroline Erhardt mentioned earlier on, um, and the term became popular because it was used by Jordan and by Felix Klein. So this is where the term monodromy or monodromy comes into mathematics. A little hint of what Riemann was to do with this, we have the branch behavior described at each of the singular points, little a, little b, little c, by a matrix. So he now wants to take his basis of solutions around one of these branch points and carry it around another one of these branch points and see what he gets. And so he starts writing down what you get. You get more matrices, obviously. And he satisfies himself that the coefficients of the hypergeometric equation in this case determine all of the entries in all of the matrices. And so the equation, the differential equation, determines precisely the monodromy of uh, the solutions. And then he reverses the argument in unpublished material and shows that the equation determines um, the matrices completely, not just the ratio of the coefficients. And then if you allow yourself uh, certain simplifications that allow you to make uh, pass to a problem in which some of the exponents are zero, two of the exponents are zero, the exponent differences remain the same as they were before the transformation you've made, but the exponents themselves have become zero on two occasions, then actually the monodromy determines the hypergeometric equation completely. If there's only one equation with that monodromy. It will not be true if you have more singular points. So this is quite a profound study of branching behavior, monodromy, and differential equations. And now we pass to, uh, I suppose, the local hero. Um, and a very familiar story. I should say, of course, if, as I should have done before, that everything I'm saying is, I'm sure, very familiar to many, or perhaps most of you. Um, so, Henri Poincaré. Um, I'm hoping you see four pictures of a torus, um, at least the one on the left and the one on the right with a homology basis drawn in. Uh, and uh, probably at the age of 10, you were told that the pictures below are also pictures of toruses and mathematicians glue the edges together and all of this. Um, and I'm hoping, first of all, it appears. Yes, here we are. I'm not at this stage wanting you to see this picture of a torus. This is also a picture of a torus. As you know, we're going to explain why in a minute. But I don't want you to see that one. I want you to see the other pictures, first of all. Um, back to Riemann for a moment. Um, Riemann had discussed branched covers of the sphere and how branched coverings of the sphere are related to algebraic curves. So uh, that's the story that mathematicians then tried to understand after Riemann's work, how you could have an algebraic curve, that's a polynomial in Z and W, and you could realize it as a branch covering of the Z plane or the Riemann sphere. Um, and you could then cut it up in the fashion we cut up the torus before and obtain some kind of understanding of the cut up surface, um, which would be a four P sided polygon if the genus of your curve was P. These ideas are coming in after Riemann. They're coming in um, perhaps more in the German world, um, thanks perhaps to Klebsch, uh, than they were immediately in France. Um, and they are, of course, rather difficult to understand because the happy little picture we have of the torus doesn't really show you how it is mapped down as a branched covering of a sphere. So there are all kinds of conceptual or technical difficulties in the way of understanding all of this. But that's the background to, uh, or part of the background to this story. Um, another part of the background is, of course, the Franco-Prussian War. So Franco-Prussian War, I need hardly say, was a catastrophe for France. And it provoked an enormous debate about the decline of French science, what might be done to revive French science, uh, and how, in particular, do we French catch up with the Germans? Right? These seem to have understood and grasped something that the French had understood at the time of Napoleon, but seemed to have lost uh, control of. And so there are many prizes offered by the French in various subjects, uh, which have as a subtext uh, catch up with some German scholar and explain it to us so that we can keep up with the Germans. And this is one in particular. The judges, uh, Emit is the important one here, but Bertrand, Bonnet, Puiseux, Bouquet, um, are 
involved in this. The German they want to catch up with in this case is Lazarus Fuchs, who's a friend of Emit uh, and has been doing important work uh, in the uh, Weierstrassian spirit on differential equations for some 10 or 15 years by this time. And the subtext here is perhaps you might like to join in on Fuchs's theory of differential equations. And that's what Poincaré proceeds to do. It's one of the three things he starts doing in this period. There's number theory, there's real differential equations and flows on surfaces, and there's the material we're going to have here. Um, so he's become a lecturer at the University of Caen. This has rescued him, or at least it's his choice, I suppose, uh, from being a mining inspector, which was on the agenda at the time. Um, he makes one contribution to this prize competition and then withdraws it. He makes another one in 1880, uh, and this one is eventually published only posthumously in, in these places, Acta Mathematica, after the First World War, and then the first volume of the Oeuvre, which is the second one published. Um, what he does is he goes back to the hypergeometric equation as an example of Fuchs's work. And he considers not the two independent solutions that you might say were formed a basis. He doesn't pick a basis for solutions and study the basis so much as the quotient of a basis. Under analytic continuation, this quotient will reproduce in the fashion I've shown here. Okay? Each member of the basis comes back as the sum of the basis vectors. The quotient comes back looking like this. And you can uh, stop two-thirds of the way down the slide with a many-valued function. Fine, that's not a problem. Or you might think it was more helpful to study the uh, inverse function, the set theoretic inverse function, which is in some sense periodic. It's automorphic, we would prefer to say today. And Poincaré thought that it was um, sensible to track this problem geometrically, that the um, if you start with a hypergeometric equation and you suppose that the equation has real coefficients, um, then what you are really looking at is the image of the upper half plane, which you must think of as a triangle. It has a vertex at zero, a vertex at one, and a vertex at infinity. It's a rather strange looking triangle. The angles of the image are determined by the exponent differences. Okay? So the image will look like a triangle. The image of the lower half plane will look like a triangle. The image of the whole plane minus the three singular points will look like a quadrilateral. And now as you do your analytic continuation, the quadrilateral is picked up and moved around and joined on to what you've already had until perhaps it overlaps itself. So Poincaré, but not Fuchs, spent a lot of time thinking, well, what about the shape of this net that we're building up as we put the quadrilaterals down next to each other? What am I going to get? In this particular case, uh, you will see that the angles are given by pi over 2, pi over 3, pi over 6, um, which adds up to pi. We have a triangle whose angle sum makes it a Euclidean looking triangle. And Poincaré investigated what happens, and he found that you would be able to obtain a parallelogram, which was mapped to itself. It's made up of several copies of the upper and lower half plane put together. Um, and in this way, because it was a parallelogram that was moving around, you were seeing really an elliptic function for the inverse of the quotient of a basis of solutions. And so he drew it. Now, this is a prize competition. I have to like Poincaré for a number of reasons. This is a prize competition. So he is writing on pieces of individual pieces of paper his work, and he comes to make a drawing of this. And he gets it wrong. So he hands it in. He doesn't scrap that piece of paper, throw it away, and do a neat drawing. He just sends it in. So I thought I would exert myself and show you what he couldn't do. This is the only thing I can do that Poincaré can't. I can draw you the net of the triangles forming quadrilaterals. I can put them together and make a hexagon. I can add the extra ones and make a parallelogram. Right? This is what Poincaré failed to draw. OK. Um, so in this case, you have angles of pi by 2, pi by 3, pi by 6. You can see them in these triangles. They fit together in this fashion, and eventually you will wind up somehow or other with a periodic, doubly periodic function, an elliptic function. Then he took other angles. Again, we have here um, 1 over n. So the angles are going to be pi over n. This is to ensure that they fit together nicely at the vertices. Right? You should find 4 fitting together, pi over 4. You should find 8 fitting together if the angles are pi by 4. 6 if the angles are pi by 3, 12 if the angles are pi by 6. He starts to draw them, and this is one of the drawings from the published version. Um, 
And uh, now he finds that the triangles do not go very far. They are all trapped inside a certain disk. And all the edges of the triangles he's drawing are perpendicular to this, the boundary of this disk. So everything is happening inside uh, the unit circle, if you like, and every angle, every edge he draws is an arc of a circle perpendicular to this boundary or perhaps a diameter of the circle. So this is uh, what he discovers. And I now have some pages of, of quotations from this very famous essay he writes much, much later, 1907, 1908, when he talks to the Société de Psychologie en Paris, and he explains how he came to these discoveries. But if you don't want to read all of the French, and you surely don't want to hear my French accent, then look to see right at the bottom where we have uh, a mention of Fuchsian functions and uh, the hypergeometric series. So this is what he has been um, working on. He's been blocked for some time. Um, he has um, a cup of coffee, contrary to his usual habit, and um, ideas surge up in his mind at the cost of a night of no sleep, um, which, generally speaking, for Poincaré, was, he considered too high a price to pay. He was not willing to crank out more mathematics by giving himself coffee and bad night's sleep. He very much worried about his sleep. But it's productive on this case, and he comes to this uh, conclusion that he can construct um, these particular things. But he's actually blocked um, at going beyond triangles. So differential equations with three singular points he can do. Four or more singular points he can't, and of course he feels acutely um, that um, this is a problem. And also he, I jumped ahead, he also at this stage wants to explain something else. He has been looking at triangles, which are images of the upper and lower half plane. He's been doing analytic continuation. At some stage, he also thinks of these transformations in a different way. This is the famous story of him boarding a bus on a trip. It's a mining engineering expedition. And he's talking to somebody, and as he puts his foot on the step of the bus, he realizes that the transformations of his triangles have been transformations from non-Euclidean geometry. Well, he's in conversation with somebody. He can't check this now. He waits till he goes home to the hotel in the evening, and he checks it in the hotel in the evening. Um, we should all have such bus trips, it seems to me. Um, what has happened here is that the version of non-Euclidean geometry that was known in, in Paris at the time and regarded as the best mathematical account is due to Beltrami. And in Beltrami's account, you draw uh, inside the unit disk geodesics with respect to the non-Euclidean metric as straight lines. Now, here's Poincaré has been straightening out his triangles to try and understand the analytic continuation of them. So in his head as he boards the bus, he sees a picture of a disk with triangles drawn with straight lines in. And he goes, oh, a disk, straight lines? That's Beltrami's non-Euclidean geometry. And then he goes, but when I began this story, my triangles had particular angles and my map was conformal. So can I get that model of non-Euclidean geometry? And as I'm sure you all know, you can get that model. You can convert the straight line picture of Beltrami to the picture we had before, where the geodesics are arcs of circles perpendicular to the boundary, or they are perhaps uh, diameters of the circle. So this is what he uh, sorts out to his satisfaction. Um, and now he goes back to the prize competition, and he says, OK, let's take a general case, but still only triangular, and see what we get. And he pushes this for two more supplements, one right at the end of the, the period. These were lost in, I have to say, the Académie des Sciences um, for quite some considerable time and were eventually discovered and published by Scott Walter and myself um, a few years ago. The supplement, uh, a marvelous addition to the original essay, uh, he still didn't win the prize. Um, but what he has in the supplement is a way of thinking about how these quadrilaterals are fitting together. It's not analytic continuation now. It's congruence, non-Euclidean isometric equivalence. Okay? So the quadrilaterals, or whatever they might be, are now congruent copies. So he has a geometrical way of thinking about the moving around. And he can begin to study uh, what happens as you rotate about this <coughs> object, or rotate about that. He calls it crab-wise. I sort of imagine it creeping across the disk in this kind of fashion. 
And he says, well, then this, is, this is geometry. And what is, after all, geometry? Um, the blue here is his underlining, and the red is just for us to follow our story. Um, <coughs> to study geometry is to study a group, he says. In this case, it is the group of non-Euclidean uh, geometry, the geometry, the pseudo-geometry de Lobachevsky, uh, and that's all we're doing. And he has this view, I should say, throughout his life that, that to study geometry is to study the action of a group. And it gives us a convenient language, he says, for explaining what we're doing. Now I catch up with the story I started before. He still can only do three singular points. And there are differential equations with four, five, and any number of singular points. He's upset, he's stuck, he goes for a walk, and he realizes that what he's been studying when he was studying number theory a la Amit is just the kind of transformations he needs. This is the, if you want to connect it to our previous story, this is the one Euclidean geometry model you get as the disk as one half of the hyperboloid of two sheets. Okay, you can think of the hyperboloid of two sheets. Here's one half, here's the other. Each of these carries non Euclidean geometry in a natural way, but the group now is um, SO21, I would say. So it, he spots this, and this enables him to study differential equations with any number of singular points and to go beyond the hypergeometric equation in this fashion. So another enlarged picture, I'm afraid. Um, this is Felix Klein. This is the point at which Felix Klein finds out what Poincaré has been doing, and he's very angry. Felix Klein is very angry because Poincaré has called these new functions and these new transformations Fuchsian. After all, he learned about it from reading the work of Fuchs. He invented it, I should say, after reading the work of Fuchs. And he's called them Fuchsian in public now, so he can't withdraw. And Klein thinks this is quite shocking. He thinks it's, it's too much credit to someone who doesn't deserve it, and, and, and. And backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, letter after letter, uh, complaining about this. And this is Poincaré's um, reply that really, OK, I would have, if I'd known of Schwarz's work, I would tell you what that is in a minute. I'd have called him Schwarzian, but I didn't, and I can't now, and Klein won't stop. Uh, so this is Schwarz. This is the, the this is the century of the beard. I have to tell you this, um, and this is his famous discovery of uh, the tessellation of the disc. You see here lots of triangles, which to Poincaré are non-Euclidean, um, but not to Schwarz. And Mittag Leffler, who has been promoting Poincaré's career for a couple of years by now, um, tells him that Schwarz is really angry. Fuchs is delighted. Everything is Fuchsian. That's good. Schwarz, of course, is really, really angry, absolutely, almost <coughs> suffocating with anger, he says. And Poincaré writes back to say, well, you know, he had the chance, and he didn't take it. Um, you know, I'm sorry to give this in English. I didn't have time to find it back in, the, in this, my French sources. Um, you know, but Schwarz is really angry with himself for having had an important result in his hands and not profiting from it. And I can do nothing about that. That's perfectly true. The difference between the Poincaré view and the Klein view is summed up by this picture. This is where they start from. Of course, they catch up with each other. The Poincaré view on the left is that you have the disk, you have some group action, you have some quotient space, and you get, in this case, a double torus obtained from the octagon you can see in the middle. Klein is coming from a Riemannian point of view where what you start with is a branched covering of the Riemann sphere. So he doesn't immediately see that the torus has a covering. And Poincaré is not very interested in the fact that the uh, torus is the branched covering of the Riemann sphere. And for the, as a starting point, Poincaré's starting point is a better starting point. Um, but perhaps I should go back. Um, the uniformization theorem, which they are working towards now, is the claim that you can put any Riemann surface in place of the double torus, except the sphere and a sphere with two or three punctures, the only Riemann surface of genus one or more can be covered somehow by the disk. The genus one, torus one, is covered by the plane. Um, so they want to put any um, uh, Riemann surface in there and lift it up somehow. That's going to be the claim. Um, it's first made by Poincaré in 1881. Um, that somehow you can express any algebraic curve apart from the elliptic ones. 
uh, in terms of Fuchsian functions. And the, perhaps the simplest thing to say is that this is what we've all done numerous times. I mean, you've done anything with the circle, right? You replace, you parameterize the circle by these nice rational functions. Well, the claim is you can parameterize a more complicated curve by some Fuchsian functions in the same spirit. The next year, Klein has a go, and pardon me, and Klein um, has one advantage over Poincaré at this point, which is that he can essentially enumerate the possible algebraic curves of a given genus. He can say that there is a certain number of moduli which count the different complex structures on these algebraic curves. Um, he gets it wrong first time round, so this is his second time at doing the enumeration, um, and the enumeration goes like this. You can roughly count, uh, you want to have a polygon that is moved around, okay? Uh, we're going to glue the sides together, so it's a 4p side of polygon, but there can only be 2p different lengths. But there's an awful lot of angles, and then once you've counted all those parameters, you didn't really care where in the disk that, pro that polygon was. So there's a three-parameter group moving it around, so that's where you subtract three complex parameters. Uh, so you wind up with this number, it's a, it's a rough and ready parameter count. But the point is, it says that the number of polygons in the disk is uh, of four p sides is roughly speaking three p minus three as a complex parameter count. And that's the number of moduli. Your algebraic curve of genus p is, has a complex structure. The moduli space of those complex structures has the same dimension, three p minus three. It's too good to be true. It really must be the case that each polygon somehow gives you one complex structure. And all the different polygons you can have of the right number of sides, modulo a certain equivalents, are going to give you all the different complex structures. This is the uniformization theorem. There's just as many Fuchsian groups as there are uh, complex structures. And this is the theorem they want to prove. Um, Klein has a sleepless night. He suffered terribly from asthma. He goes on holiday. It's a disaster. The asthma won't let him rest. He's awake in the middle of the morning. And guess what? he realizes there's a way of proving this theorem. And he, he states it, and he get, just decides he's had it with the holiday. He's going to go back home to Dusseldorf, write this up, and tell people about it. And that's what he says he does. Um, he writes to Poincaré. He writes to Schwartz. He writes to Hurwitz um, to tell them about the uh, uniformization theorem. And he says, this is the one that um, uh, everybody, this is the one. I, I sort of know this, he said. I should have known all along. This picture, uh, it's a little hard to see in this reproduction, which comes from one of his students, but it's the one I think we all go back to when we want to tell this bit of the story. Uh, this has a 14-sided figure in the middle. Actually, it gives rise to a Riemann surface of genus 3. Um, the other pictures explain how the vertices fit together. And he says, you know, I knew this picture. I should have got the story from just this picture. That's what he's saying to himself. Um, uh, okay, um, it's usual uh, when I give a talk, or maybe when for other people when I give a talk, there is somebody in the audience who knows more about the subject. Uh, this is perhaps an occasion where I am outnumbered 17 to 1, I don't know. But the book I refer to here has 17 authors. Um, perhaps some of you are in the room. Um, thank you, it's a lovely book. Um, and it spares me having to say anything at all about the uniformization theorem and its complicated history, which lasts until 1907 before we get the real proofs. Um, but it's around from 1883 as um, an option. Poincaré has a, a go at proving it, not just for algebraic curves now, but for multi-valued functions of any kind. Um, and he sends it to Mittag Leffler, who edits Acta Mathematica for publication. And this is what um, Mittag Leffler says, right? Isn't that terrific? In analysis, there is no theorem which, in its striking simplicity, surpasses this. But the, uh, let me tell you what you have to do. You have a multi-valued function. So you must find the domain of the functions that are going to be used as the uniformizing parameters. Right? And then you have to study the map from the, uh, this new domain, which you've constructed, back down to the curve or multi-valued function or Riemann surface that you're talking about. And what Poincaré thought you might be able to do is to identify is the fundamental part of this domain, which is then moved around en bloc and fills the whole domain. So think of the octagon in that picture before. It gets mapped around. 
or the 14 gone in the picture we had later. It gets mapped around en bloc. In each case, it fills a disk. The disk <coughs> is the domain of the uniformizing parameter. So you have to construct this domain, and then you have to get a map. And Poincaré has the idea that, well, you know, the Riemann surface has lots of curves on it. And I can get from this point to that point in lots of different non-homotopic ways. And perhaps I just look at the different paths from A to B. And the different paths will somehow tell me what the whole domain is. Uh, so I've tried to draw a picture here. It's, oh, good, it's just about visible on the screen. Uh, if you start from A and go to any of the points B, you're winding up in different points in the plane uh, corresponding to different curves on the torus. The short curves are drawn on the left, the complicated curves are drawn on the right. Um, so this is Poincaré's hope that going from A to B in different ways will somehow be equivalent to a picture of the plane, in this case for the torus or the disk in the more elaborate cases. Um, so he tried to run this process in reverse and obtain, having looked at that picture and pictures like it, to obtain the domain of the uniformizing parameter in this fashion. Um, I won't delay you on this particular um, account. Um, you have a starting point, you look at the different paths. If the paths aren't homotopic, you say that the two paths are defining different points in the domain you're trying to create. It's a terrible paper. I, I've spent a lot of time this year reading Poincaré, and it, it's a clear candidate for the worst paper he wrote. Um, there's no mention of homotopy, for example. Whole blocks of ideas are simply missing. Um, it was very charitable of Mittag Leffler to um, include it. Um, it becomes <coughs> mentioned, at least, by Hilbert and the Hilbert problems in 1900, because there really are problems with whether this process has defined the domain that you want. Um, even Hilbert's being charitable. I don't think, actually, the original paper of Poincaré uh, makes sense about you supplying a lot of ideas such as homotopy. It's eventually done by Poincaré and by Kerber successfully in 1907. And as I say, there's this lovely multi-authored book to which you may refer. Um, so I think I'm now moving towards uh, my uh, conclusions because uh, I felt rather flattered to be invited to give such a paper as this, but it wasn't clear to me exactly how it fitted into the subject of this splendid colloque until I heard uh, your talk yesterday, thank you. Um, and uh, the passing mentions um, of the same topics um, that I've been talking about this morning, and I felt that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm here to sort of just give the background to some talks which are going to be taking place later on. I'm very pleased to do so. Um, so this is how we get to Galois from this. There's no mention of Galois, I should say, by name in these papers I've been discussing. There are two ways you can look at the picture there. Um, I've drawn point A in the bottom left-hand corner to copies of it in the same place, I believe, in the parallelograms, but in different parallelograms. You may either think of this as a bunch of paths from the point A in the bottom left-hand corner to any of the others, or you may think of it as an instruction to move the entire plane so that the point A goes to the point A. So each homotopy class of paths is really the same as some action of some group element. Right? So the fundamental group, I think, is going to call the fundamental group, is acting, in this case, on that plane, and you would have a similar picture in the disk model, but then much harder to draw. Um, so, from this point of view, what you have for the uh, disk or for the plane, seen as a universal covering space, is that the fundamental group is acting on the universal covering space, which is the disk or the plane, and uh, the quotient space is the Riemann surface. So, instead of just seeing those paths, you can think of it as a group action that's moving things along. Um, Depends on what block you're moving around. Um, if you have larger figures to move around, you have smaller uh, groups to move around. And uh, a group moving a polygon around is a normal subgroup of a group moving a sub-polygon around. You've got more freedom of movement if you're moving a smaller thing about. Um, in each case, you get a Riemann surface if you have two different groups. And this, this picture is an attempt to draw a square divided into four little squares. Um, if you think you can move from A to A, you're thinking of the little square as the fundamental domain, and you get a torus. If you're thinking that you can only move the big square around, then you're going to get uh, a different 
torus, and you're going to have a map from um, one to the other, because if you're moving in a little square, the lines from A to A will correspond to group elements. If you're moving in a big square, the lines from little a to little a do not correspond to group elements. So putting this together in the language we heard, in fact, this morning, if you have a non-constant analytical map from a Riemann surface X to another Y, then what you have is a finite branch covering of Y by X. So here's X, and it maps down onto Y. Now, every Riemann surface has a field of meromorphic functions on it, and the pullback map gives you a map from the meromorphic functions on Y to the meromorphic functions on X. And as I've said before, if you've got these two uh, polygon, these two Riemann surfaces obtained from two polygons, one sitting nicely inside the other, so that the big polygon is made up of lots of copies of the small polygon, those Riemann surfaces with that map from X to Y give you a situation where you have uh, a map of the groups, a corresponding map in the other direction of the quotient spaces, and this is a Galois correspondence, as it turns out. Okay, so that forms my conclusion, actually, to the talk. Um, thank you very much. On peut demander, poser des questions en français, si vous pouvez parler un peu lentement. Je vais commencer alors. Qui est le premier mathématicien qui a compris cette, que la théorie de Galois des extensions et la théorie des revêtements étaient très faste Je ne sais pas, j'ai voulu attendre des conférences. À demain Je ne suis pas sûr. Je ne suis pas sûr. Peut-être c'est. Euh, des mathématiciens, des mathématiciens modernes. Euh... Non, d'abord, M. Cartier. La, la mention la plus an, euh, ancienne que je connaisse de la correspondance entre revêtement et euh, groupe de Galois, c'est dans un livre d'Hermann Weil de 1925, qui, est, qui, est, qui a été publié il y a assez récemment, parce qu'il s'était publié après sa mort. Et euh, il y a tout un premier chapitre sur la topologie des surfaces de Riemann. Je pourrais vous montrer le livre. Et à la fin, il dit bien « groupe de Galois ». Il, il fait le lien entre « groupe de Motopie et « groupe de Galois ». Mais je ne sais pas y a eu des, si c'était connu avant. <rire> What I cannot remember now is if in the first edition of Weil's book, he makes this reference to Galois. It's not the book. It's not the book. OK. So we have a, which way around is it? A lower band. We need to go back up a little, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, I, was, I was wondering about the, the relation between uh, various parts of Poincaré's work, uh, this one, uh, the work on uh, general, uh, the creation of topology, mm -hmm. uh, because one common point would be Betty, since Poincaré took uh, the Betty numbers, we saw how much Betty worked on Galois in his youth, and uh, now we see um, both situations, both parts of Poincaré's work as very related and united by Galois theory, but probably Poincaré did not. No, he did not. So, uh, two things to say. When he does his work on three manifolds, so the Poincaré conjecture, um, in the end you have two handle bodies, two solid tori, or two solid double tori, uh, which you glue together in an interesting way, you make an identification. These are presented by regarding them, what he works with is Fuchsian polygons. So he thinks of the surface of these handle bodies as, as cut up into a Fuchsian polygon. So he make, always comes back to this language, even though now there's somehow some solid here and some solid here that are getting identified together to make the, the Frankeray space. Um, Poincaré has a very curious attitude to algebra. So he very much likes number theory, but he thinks number theory is very difficult because you do not have continuity. 
So you're driven to use analogies all the time. Um, and he gives a paper, which I must publish because most of it is not published. It was all published then conveniently, the interesting bit is forgotten. Uh, L'Avenir des Mathématiques uh, at the International Congress in 1908, which is a reply to Hilbert. And if you look in uh, Science et Méthode, the mathematics is gone, it's lost. But it's there in the original. And here he does mention algebra, group theory, things like that. But his group theory is either infinite groups, Lee, or finite groups, Galois. And it's almost the only time, I'm prepared to say the only time, but I must be wrong, <laughs> where he mentions the name Galois. So it, it, it's not something that he seems to have had in mind as, a, as an animating analogy when he discusses this kind of thing at any stage. Um, and then, I mean, there are other, many, many other analogies we could pursue. But the finite group theory does not seem to have been uh, a subject he particularly wanted to involve himself with. Uh, yeah. yeah, but there's another curious thing. He doesn't very often care about an individual group in this Fuchsian work. He says there are Fuchsian groups of different polygons, and there's lots of them. But it's Klein who, for instance, studies that particular one in some detail and has interesting things to say about the, the corresponding quotient group, the group of order 168. So Bancaré sort of floats over the surface of these things. Uh, he seems to have worked at that level and not to want to go and give particular examples of the general story. S'il n'y a pas d'autres questions dans cette salle, on va passer la parole à l'amphi d'Arbou à côté, où ils ont sûrement d'autres questions à poser. Comme la moitié du public est de l'autre côté, ils ont le droit de poser aussi des questions. Par contre, il faut que la technique suive. Ah, ah, du voilà. Non, c'est pas la moitié du public. Ils ont entendu vous pouvez poser des questions, clairement. <rire> Donc, est-ce que dans l'amphi d'à côté, vous avez des questions à poser euh, suite à l'exposé de Jeremy Cray <rire> Les dieux se fâchent, mais. <rire> On peut remercier une nouvelle fois le... le